I'd like to thank everyone for showing up tonight. Um, you must have heard that me as vice president was going to, to run this instead of the regular president, otherwise <laughs> our, we would not have this kind of an audience. <laughs> um, and I apologize for it being late. We were actually in the executive session in a discussion about exactly what you guys probably want to talk to us about. Um, so um, I think <laughs> I think before we get started with our actual session, and I promise to get to you guys quickly so you don't have to sit through this whole thing, um, we have a, uh, a presentation this evening. Oh, actually, I need to do a roll call, don't I? Yes. Here. 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 Um, we have a presentation this evening uh, to start us off uh, about the uh, accessory dwelling units that are proposed by the Sacramento County. And Jessica Brent, senior planner, is uh, here to uh, discuss that with us. And thank you for coming. Okay, well thank you for having me. I'm Jessica Brandt with the Office of Planning and Environmental Review. Um, I was asked to come out here to talk a little bit about changes we've recently made to our zoning code related to accessory dwelling units. Um, I don't know, I wasn't expecting this many people and I, I don't want to belabor it too much. So I don't know if um, the council could tell me kind of what your interests are related to this. Is it more how it interacts with um, the CCNRs that you have, or uh, do you want me to just give kind of a brief overview on it? And That'd be a good way to start. Just start with, with an overview, the CCNRs? Yeah, please. Yeah, okay. Well, you can give us a, a little overview, and then we can ask yeah. questions. If you I think want. I can go. Um, I do have handouts. I don't know if anyone is interested, but I can just sort of pass them down the road. Once you tell them what this is all about, they maybe more of them want that handout. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so since you're a captive audience, um, the, it, in uh, late uh, 2016, um, the, the state in its infinite wisdom passed some laws that related to accessory dwelling units, which are the secondary units or, or granny flats um, that, that people have on single family lots throughout the state. Um, the thought was that they wanted to make development of these second units uh, much easier. Um, mostly to, to try to address the housing crisis in the state. Uh, it's not necessarily a housing crisis in our area. It was aimed more for the Bay Area and LA. Um, it's, there, there are a lot of jurisdictions that had made it difficult or, or impossible to actually put a second unit on a property. And um, unfortunately, uh, with politics being as they are, things swing from one extreme to the other. And the state uh, required all of the jurisdictions in California to adopt regulations to allow at least a minimal size, a second unit, on all single family lots in their jurisdiction. So um, there are other portions of the, the law related to parking requirements, um, whether or not uh, an accessory structure or a accessory dwelling can be rented out or not, and the like. And so I'll kind of go through those. 
Um, the, the state law also um, restricted whether CCNRs can um, restrict uh, building of uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, it did leave the ability to, um, to have uh, some review on design and development of the units and then the size, uh, but not necessarily uh, just banning them completely. So, okay. May I interrupt yeah. as, as you're going there? Uh, so we, that's basically saying though that our CCNRs would not apply because it doesn't fit within the, 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 the square footage. Uh, our, our CCNRs say it has to be 1,800 square feet. Did you say 1,800? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's your CC, your, for an accessory dwelling unit? No. no oh. we've, we've not defined accessory dwelling. Oh. Okay. Um, is that correct, Greg? We allow accessory dwelling units, uh, but we don't allow them to be rented. And so I think yeah. the question would, under the new ordinance of the county, if, if, a, if a homeowner puts in a, a, an accessory dwelling unit, can they now rent that unit out? And how does that impact, uh, like street parking, if you have those additional mm -hmm. people uh, living in the community, and also with new development, uh, is that going to affect? It? Right now, if he's got a density approved of 800 units, with this new law where they can add an accessory dwelling unit to that 800, does that reduce this density from 800 to a lower number? So the the way that the law is set up is that accessory dwelling units don't count against density. So uh, you wouldn't count them as a, a, another unit related to whether or not you meet density requirements. Um, the, in, in most places in the county, uh, you are allowed to rent out the, uh, the unit, um, but the state law did not preclude locals from putting a limit on renting out a unit. So it sounded like, just from talking with Mark earlier, that your CCNRs do prohibit renting these units, and that's allowed to remain. Um, there are uh, some additional bills coming through the legislature. It seems like kind of once they got going, they, they haven't stopped. And so they are, um, they are looking at restricting the amount of checking that a jurisdiction or a, a homeowners association can do to make sure that someone is not renting a unit. Um, but that hasn't passed yet. So right now the, the ban on rentals can remain as is. Um, I actually have a question about um, the, the zoning. Mm -hmm. um, does, does the resident have to be zoned multifamily to make this work? No. No, so, this, so this goes they, for... So basically none of the zoning would have to be changed on any of the lots we have. Correct. Yeah, it's, um, it's more That's a function... That's really kind of vague mm -hmm. in here. And in some places it says that, that, that you have to go through a zoning change. Um, okay. So as far as, is that our, what are you guys looking at? Well, it, 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 if, you, if you look at your, your lead document here mm -hmm. on the second paragraph up on the bottom, it said uh, ADUs that do not meet required zoning code development standards mm -hmm. um, must have special development, uh, special permits. Right. Uh, so, so those standards are in here. They're not talking about our zoning standard or a building zoning standard. They're talking about the, the standards that are in here that right. are completely different. Right, but I would look at it, um, you know, like a layer cake. So these are our zoning standards. You also have building code standards, and then you have your HOA standards. And all of those, someone building in Rancho Marietta would need to check the boxes for all of your standards. So if you have stricter standards or different architectural standards, then those would, they would have to address those because they've signed all the paperwork to be, uh, to abide by your CCNRs. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it's still yeah. something vague. Um, I, 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 there's also a place in here, and maybe I'm jumping around a little mm -hmm. bit on you and I apologize, but there's also a place in here where it talks about existing homes. Uh, so none of this applies to new development that might come into the area, or does it? Oh yeah, it does. Oh yeah. Yeah, this, this applies. So the one thing that the state did was that if you have an existing home or an existing outbuilding, let's say you have a detached garage, um, they uh, restricted local governments from um, doing any sort of review on a, a conversion to an accessory dwelling unit of that structure 
other than building permits. So in that case, the layer cake, a couple of layers have gotten removed because they no longer have to go through if there was any HOA review, they no longer have to go through that, and then they no longer have to go through our zoning review. They're considered compliant as far as zoning. So someone taking an existing structure, not make any external changes, but inside turning it into a livable space, the state said, that's a total go. Okay, so if I understood what you said, we have, we have, currently we have uh, proposals to expand and, and have uh, people trying to build new homes in some of our open areas. Mm -hmm. And we have an, uh, an MBA uh, agreement with that developer about what our standards are for their development. Mm -hmm. And you're, if I understand correctly, you just told me that that's nil and void. No. For, for, so, so I misunderstood. What no. you said. I, think, I think what she said, Larry, is that if you have a, a home and it has a garage and you want to change that garage into a mother-in-law's quarters, um, the state will waive certain certain reviews. The state of the county. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the county. The county will waive. I was basically the trying review. to address new homes only, not existing homes. Right. Right. So new homes. And, and new so a homes. developer could come in mm -hmm. and change his design completely about what he's going to put on that lot. <laughs> And not, and not comply with our MBA? No, because the overall development would still have to comply with your agreement. It's the inside of the house. If they, if they come in and they have, let's say they come in, they develop it as agreed, and then some homeowner purchases it, and they go in and they change out the master bedroom into its own little unit. That's what the state says you get a pass on. Okay. That's what this I, is about. Yeah. All right. I've got a question for you. Sure. Because we have a parking variance here. So if you can had a three-car garage and you converted one into a bedroom, mm -hmm. which displaced, say, one automobile and possibly a golf cart, mm -hmm. you're saying the state would override mm -hmm. our uh, HOA rules on that? So what the state says is that, and what we adopted in our code, is that you are not required to replace uh, covered parking or, or you know, a, go a garage or a carport, anything that gets converted. Uh, but if you have HOA rules regarding parking of vehicles on your on your driveway, I'm not sure if that's a thing. Um, yeah. Then that would still apply. So effectively, it would be, yeah, sure, you can take this portion of your garage, but that doesn't mean you can then put your golf cart or your car just out on your driveway. Okay. Yeah. Do we have anything in the CCNRs about converting garages into livable space? Yes, you know? we do. Yes, we do. Yes. yes. Yeah. So I think that would probably cover a lot of the... Not if it's an accessory dwelling unit. Okay. It, so if it, they were just doing a bedroom, I think your CCNRs could apply. But if they came in and they said they wanted to make a second unit, I think the state would override. So okay. it's, it's, a, it's kind of a whole new world with these. So you can also have, if I understand it correctly in, in, in your documentation, you can mm -hmm. also have a separate building built out back. Correct, mm -hmm. yes. Okay, so, so my question, I'm going to go back again to the non-existing home. The developer could come in, build a home, and then put a, um, an accessory building behind it, and we couldn't stop that. No. So if they came in... And as part of their, what you couldn't stop is if they had an agreement to do the main home and an accessory, let's say garage, an agreement they came from in. Move, an agreement from move. So you're, you were saying that you guys have your uh, MBA. MBA, MBA, MBA. MBA. Yeah. Um, and so they have the rules as far as that goes. Say so you have signed off on separate garages, for example, under that. Then if they came in, they built out, and then the owner came back later and transferred or changed that garage into a living space. That's what you can't stop. Anything new still has to go through all of your processes. Good. I swear. So, so but, but this, this doesn't call whatever you do, whether it's a, an outbuilding mm -hmm. or whether it's built internally within the existing home, that doesn't qualifies a multifamily 
no. uh, lot. Anymore. No, that, yes. That doesn't fall into a separate category. No, and that, um, when this first came up, uh, it, it's interesting because there's the potential that effectively everywhere in the state could uh, double density uh, if everyone put a second unit on their property. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot of discussion on impacts to infrastructure. Um, so that's, that's wow. uh, an ongoing, ongoing concern of local Including infrastructure roads. providers. What's that? Including roads. In, yeah, roads, sewer, water. Uh, yeah. yeah, water would be huge out here. Yeah. So, so what, uh, uh, I realize that maybe there's a difference in definition of manufactured home, but it, mm. uh, it, 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 this uh, kind of implies that, that they're, uh, could, that they're available under this ordinance. They are, but again, if you have CCNRs that restrict to stick-built homes, um, then that would still apply. Okay. Yeah. Um, is, is there anybody in the audience that would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Jessica a question? Go ahead, John. John. John Merchant. Hi, John. Hi. Uh, I'm the CPAC rep representative, one of the two for Ranch Murrieta. We beat this to death for six months. Um, <laughs> First of all, number one. No, you we, didn't, because it's still a lot. Yeah, we, number number one, number one, um, number number one. The county really had no choice. We had a rigorous procedure for accessory dwellings, which went out the window because it doesn't comply with state law. Secondly, your 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 existing CCNRs cover, as as I understand it, and like Jessica's pointed out, some of the stuff is still in flux, but. Your existing CCNRs cover your, your initial primary dwelling. When you go look at the accessory dwelling, you merely look at the sheet. And I, I don't know if she gave you the sheet that actually has the chart on it or not. We have but, that. Okay, but you'll be able to see what is and isn't allowed based on square footage and, and the amount of property that's available. Number three, interestingly, and, and again, this is still in flux, it was made extremely clear to us as we went through the process that not only could you rent the accessory dwelling, but you could also rent the primary residence. So you could conceivably buy two houses on a block, put two accessory dwellings in, and then you would essentially be a landlord hosting four individual rented units. And, and a lot of this is going to depend on how much strength as it gets tested, the CCNRs would hold against the state law. And I think Greg pointed out you can already put an accessory dwelling here as long as it complies architecturally and inside the boundaries and everything else. Um, but as far as development goes, number one, the application that's at the county at the present time, even before the accessory dwelling unit was, was passed, called for casitas. Casitas are the fancy word for accessory dwellings. So that developer had already laid in place a request to build those even before this law came into place. Part of the problem will that will be if you, for example, go into places like Elk Grove in Laguna West, where you see the very nice up and down two-story garage underneath, and uh, or, or uh, two-story with a, a living space underneath and the garage behind. Each one of those garages is, is a separate living unit. So every one of those houses along that stretch in Laguna West is really two dwellings. Well, none of, none of this has been forecast for us uh, as to what this does on the impact on parking, the impact on traffic, and the impact on water, conceivably with a 75-gallon average capacity per day per person I mean, you could put that up by three times the existing projected usage that we have in our water supply assessments and everything else. So it's, it's an extremely, it's an extremely uh, critical thing that we know what the impact is. If you, if you test a developer's, if you test a developer's uh, plan or his application, uh, do you test it assuming that 10% will have an accessory dwelling? Do you test it that 20% will have one? Do you test it if 50% will have one, keeping in mind that 
in this community, not as much as in some communities, like down on the peninsula and down in Silicon Valley, if you build an accessory dwelling, you can rent it for $2,500 a month. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on here, and a lot of it is still relatively undefined. CSD is going to put a placeholder in place at the county to let them know, hey, you know, we need guidance here. Uh, but it's something I think that's really critical, and you keep, you need to keep your yourself completely informed. Now, John, did I did I understand correctly that regardless of what our CCNR say, that they can convert the garages into living units now? That and again, like Jessica said, a lot of it was in flux, but that was that was something that was raised at the CPAC meetings, and and it was indicated to us at least at that point, six months ago, eight months ago. That yes, that you could displace storage for living space. The whole this whole thing is about living space. Somebody at the state says we need more housing, and this is a way to get it. So, as you go forward, you're going to have to really try to understand what that means and what the impact is on us as a community. But I think it's really most significant in development, because if he's telling you that he's going to build 827 houses, he has the potential really. Of building 12 or 1300 yeah. Yeah. and that's an impact on everything else that goes on here and that's that's exactly what I read out of this so was yeah. that that's where that's where we need to have our emphasis here and as, as more of this comes out you know we'll try and keep you informed with it but it's still really all floating okay. around up thanks John Jessica you have anything else to to hit us with you right <laughs> aren't you glad you brought me out here um, <laughs> No, I mean, I think the, the only thing is, is, like John was saying, things keep um, changing. Um, the, the Association of Counties and some of the other kind of legislative advocacy arms are fighting tooth and nail to try to keep as much local control as we can. Uh, but it, it, it's definitely, it seems like the floodgates are opening. Um, it looks like there's a, uh, a bill going through right now um, that passed the Assembly and is being considered in the Senate that would require uh, local jurisdictions to allow up to 800 square feet in accessory dwelling by right. Um, I don't know if that will pass as, you know, as proposed, but it's definitely in there. Right now we only have to do what's called a reasonable size, and so we allow a six or 800 square foot, depending on the size of your lot. Um, so we could be looking at potentially you know, 4,000 square foot lots with 800 square foot second units. Is that an assembly bill? Yeah, it's assembly bill 2164. AB 2164. AB, AB, yeah. I have a copy of it. You have a spare? I have it in here. Is there any other bills in the works? There were two others. Um, they died. Ooh. So uh, we'll see if anything else comes up. But this one. Um, is it definitely seems to have legs and there's always the you know opportunity for folks to throw their stuff that got thrown by the wayside into someone else's bill so um, yeah so we're definitely keeping an eye on all of this and the infrastructure I think um, is a huge issue and I think it will become more so um, the t it 10 percent seems reasonable right now because you do have to pay a lot of impact fees and um, you know connection fees and uh, you so it, people who are doing these accessory dwellings, it's not a cheap undertaking right now um, anywhere in the county. Um, but if uh, some other, there's more going on at the state at, that's trying to pull back, um, for instance, not allowing school districts to charge impact fees for these second dwellings. Um, right now they charge fees, they wouldn't be allowed to. Same with water districts, park districts, sewer districts and the like. So. Um, that could bump up the number of these units significantly. I feel like I'm doomsdaying it, but it's, um, it, it, you know, yeah. it's, it's a thing. <laughs> um, do we have a way to m maintain communication with you as this um, yeah. process develops? Yeah, I know, you know, Mark has been in touch, um, John. And so I think they're, they're both keeping an eye and an ear to the ground. Um, my... Info is not on here, um, but I do have some cards, and I can pass them around as well. And our assemblyman, his name is? Your, yours, I'm not sure, 
actually. Ken, Ken Cooley? Ken Cooley? Okay. Okay. Yeah, most of the bills are coming from the Bay Area. Um, yeah. They generate out of the Bay Area? They're being generated out of the Bay Area. Um, uh, Anthony Weiner is a big one. Um, he, does a, he does a lot of this. This is his thing. I know. So I don't, I don't necessarily know. Does anyone else have any, any other questions on it? Thanks, Jessica. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sure. That's an it. That's very. Uh, so we are we are seeing. So the the question was whether there's a prohibition on using these accessory dwellings for like an Airbnb kind of um, use. Um, there is not. They could be used for that. And in fact, in other areas of the county, we are seeing that quite a bit. Um, people, I I I love Carmichael. I live in Carmichael. I don't know why, but Carmichael seems to be like um, the epicenter for Airbnbs in the county. I don't know why. I, you know, but um, it is, and we see a lot of folks that are putting in um, small casitas in the back of their property and renting those out as Airbnbs, and that's, they bring it in, that's exactly what they're going to do, um, and they, they find that it's a, a reasonable moneymaker for them. So the state is not precluding that, um, the county did not preclude that, uh, the, the Board of Supervisors decided against um, requiring that uh, either unit, I think as John had mentioned, either unit be um, owner occupied. Um, the state is, would allow us to do that, but that was not the, the chosen path for the county. So, did Brent, that, would you like to add I would, to? Well, I mean, I, th I think in that, as far as the Airbnbs and stuff goes, I mean, we do have restrictions, and those restrictions are in our CC and ours, and so we don't have to worry about that at this time. Okay, so you do have restrictions yep. in your CCNRs? Yes. Okay. And so that's not something that's prohibited to be restricted. I'm trying to find that. Aha. AB 2890. That for, the, um, for the audience's information, you want to want to just maybe paraphrase that? It's like short-term rentals are not permitted, and that's, that's 30 days or less right. mm -hmm. in the community. I don't know if people know that or not, because I that's think it happens. Short-term rentals are called 30 days or less, and they're not permitted in our community. And then also the rental of the accessory units are prohibited also in our CCNRs. And so if, a, if somebody wanted to build one and have their, their mother or mother-in-law kind of live with it, they could do it for that purpose, but they could not use it as a rental unit, so to produce income. But that's where the fight is. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the state is slowly chipping away at that. So. Do at, at the moment, it appears you'll not yet, though. <laughs> all of our supervisors voted against that, by the way. They, they want all of it rented, or the ability to rent it all. Oh, no, I think it was three to, three to two. Three to two. It, was, it was three to two. Yeah. yeah. Peters did not want it rented, and neither did Natoli. So, um, yeah. Um, anything more for me? Thanks, Jessica. Okay, go, go on to pickleball. It's much more important. <laughs> <laughs> more important things, huh? <laughs> um, I do suspect that many of you here are would would like to address the issue of of um, security, uh, speed control, uh, stop time violations, and and et cetera. And that is actually on the agenda. And typically, at this point, I would read you something that says that if, if an item is on the agenda, please wait till that item comes up to discuss it. But since I am not going to drag you through another hour and a half of this meeting, I will allow you to speak now. If you will keep your comments to three minutes, there's a timer up here, and, and hopefully we wouldn't have every one of you talk. But please address the microphone and give us your lot number and your name if you would like to discuss uh, moving violations or security. In that vein, uh, Robin Al... Oh, God. <laughs> Robin Albi-Kessich, lot 1529. <laughs> 
Um, Saturday about noon, I was at Plaza F Marietta Market, formerly known as Plaza Foods, uh, grocery shopping. I had my car parked down near the former Chinese restaurant, walked down, unloaded my groceries, talked to a couple people, came back, there was a cart. It wasn't a golf cart. It was called a June buggy, parked in front of the store. It had a, looked like an aftermarket box on the back of that. In that box was a infant child seat with a black mesh cover over it. Next to it were two gas cans. Oh, and there was no adult, anybody present in that cart. A woman was standing there and I, I initially thought it was an empty carrier and I'm thinking, boy, if somebody comes out of that store, I'm going to kind of question them. She says, no, there's a baby in there. And it was, I looked at my, when I got, while well, I was in my golf cart, it was mid-90s, maybe a little lower. So I finally looked and the baby wasn't moving, looked to be about two, three months old. So we both kind of waited, and this dad comes out about two or three minutes, I don't know, later with a two-year-old. And uh, I said, you know, there's a baby in there, and it's in the 90s, and he's next to golf cart. Well, so? She didn't like the cold house. She wanted to be out here, and I'm like, I'm glad she told you that. And um, I said, are those gas cams empty? Yes. I said, well, according to what my husband's told me, they're more dangerous when they're full of fumes and in this heat. Mm -hmm. Well, mind your own business. And of course, I elicited that sort of response. And I said, I won't mind my own business when there's a child's uh, life at stake here. A, an infant, a helpless infant. Uh, and prior to him coming out, I had called security. And I said, there is an unattended child sitting in the heat with gas cans next to them. Would you Oh, I said, and they're like, where? I go, in front of Marietta Market. You mean in the plaza? Yes, in the plaza, in front of the old grocery store. Please hurry. So after this individual left, I was shaking pretty hard, and I was talking to this other woman. I kind of hung around, hoping security would show up. Nothing. Got in my golf cart, slowly made my way, kind of keeping my eyes open. Nothing. Went home, told my husband I was very upset. Well, I posted on my Facebook page. <laughs> And um, I never got a call back or anything. So A, I don't like what I'm seeing with parents and kids in golf carts, that's a given. And B, I was shocked at the lack of a response. And I do have a photo. But there was no identification on the card except a barcode, and I don't think it's used for golf. <clears throat> Any questions? By any chance, did you call uh, CSD? No. I think, uh, well, I had called 2273. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I called uh, security I would, and, you I know. Would just, just a recommendation. I thought of they, that. And I, you know, Murray and I talked. To hear, and, they would want to hear something about yeah. like that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty dangerous. And I did, ironically, see the same cart on Sunday. Uh, and there was the same fellow driving it, but nothing with him. And the two-year-old he put in the seat was also unrestrained. So, just say it. Anyway, now I'm going to start shaking it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, in, in between here, I, I'll, I'll add something once in a while. But uh, remember that we only contract to CSD for security. Where the real issue is in situations like this, who needs to hear those stories is CSD themselves. So they have a meeting tomorrow night at 5 o'clock. I hope those of you who can, will attend, and share your information with them also. It, it's very important that, that we do this. Uh, next speaker. If I can add one more thing. Absolutely. If, if you're unable to attend, please send an email to, uh, and John, I'm not going to say to you, Mark Martin, okay? He's the general manager for CST. He needs to know about things like this. Ready? Yes, please. I'm Jay Solomon, lot 247. I've made a list of grievances about security, but I'm not going to read them all. Uh, some of the things that are really irritating me is the speeding, definitely the speeding. I had someone go past me today while I was coming back from uh, getting my mail. And I live on Lago, just by the, a little bit past the curve, and the guy was going so fast he drifted in the other lane. And this is 
just ridiculous, the stop sign running, ridiculous. Uh, underage kids driving golf carts, it's, I, I just don't get what the parents are doing about that. Uh, also, to go with what you said, parents with kids in their laps and they're driving golf carts. Babies. The babies, yep. Uh, I want to get down to basically the back lakes and what goes on back there with uh, the cars that, and golf carts that are uh, doing donuts back there, um, tearing the parking lot up, uh, going down the uh, levee at who knows what speed, uh, dust going everywhere. So, uh, I've been out on the lakes quite a bit fishing, and I very seldom see security come out there just to come out and patrol. I think it's very important, especially this time of year, that security comes out there and, uh, you know, just does a check periodically. Um, Which lakes in particular? Claro or Clementia? Uh, actually, all three. Claro, uh, Clementia, and Chesboro. Uh, I fish them all, so. You know, and, and like I say, I've been on uh, Calero especially. You can pretty much see the whole lake when you're on a boat. And I've been out there three, four hours and never once seen a security vehicle come out. You know. Uh, I, don't, I don't have my glasses at home, so I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so about what? Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's another issue, is the non-residents that uh, come through the gate. Uh, either they're telling security that they uh, have a golf tee time, and, I, and it's obviously not verifying it because they're out on the lakes fishing. Um, and I know that because uh, I've called, and I, they've said that, well, they, have, they were going to the golf course. Um, I think that when... Somebody comes in through the gate and they're going to the golf course, security should call the club and verify it. Uh, the other thing is, I think when someone makes a tee time that doesn't live in Rancho Marietta, the, course, uh, the uh, person taking the tee time at the club should call security and let them know this person is coming in at such and such date, such and such time. Uh, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, Uh, well, that's about all I have for right now, but I'm, I'm going to go to, this, to the meeting tomorrow night and bring all of this up. And, uh, Jay, I might give you this information that um, during this past week, we, um, had, uh, I, we had some conversation uh, and we shared some information with CSD about the fishing issues because um, Greg Mason, your president of your fishing club, gave, it, gave us some information and stuff like that. So wasn't, RMA doesn't have the authority to go out and do those kind of things regarding the sighting, but CSD certainly does. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I passed it on through John Merchant. So I think they are going to be looking at that at some point. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jay. Bill Osolinski at uh, lot uh, 1041. And I would kind of go on along with uh, what Jay's talking about. I've got my fishing hat on. And I've been uh, Inspector Clouseau, that's Peter Sellers for anyone that didn't know that, for the last five years, which means that at the fishing club, I used to go around and check, see if people were residents here. And we had a number of people that do it. Somebody would do it on Tuesday, Wednesday, and we do it a couple of times at the end. I, I've hundreds of people that don't belong, hundreds over the five years, and they're still there. As I was fishing last week, there were a couple of guys on Calero that were, they looked like uh, sheet rockers, and they were catching some fish out the shore, and we said something to them, and blah, 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 nothing happened. But anyway, my, I, have a, I have an answer to, to some of the problems. First of all, I don't know of anyone ever being fined as a resident for letting someone in that uh, didn't belong here. They, 
People come in and say, I need to go fishing at your place. Can you get me in? Sure, you call them in, and they're unaccompanied, which they're not supposed to be, and they are fishing. So we stop them, and, they go, and nothing happens. Uh, or they get a little spanking. And I, ha I like to know if anyone's ever been fined, a resident been fined, for having somebody come in and fish in our properties. Now, I know to most of the people that's not really important. But we do, if you went out to every lake recently, you'll see 10 to 15 people fishing there. Clementia, on Sunday, there was all kinds of people there, including myself. And I didn't check, you know, sometimes I'm out with Jay and there's no sticker on there, but I know they don't have to have a sticker. But I do have a solution. One, I have to pay, I pay $10 to get my sticker on my boat. There's only about five or six in the fishing club that have those stickers. No one else has a sticker. No one's ever checked me. No one's ever done it. And I don't mind paying that. I'd like to see anyone that comes in here that has a boat has to get that same sticker, $10. And I'd like to see the $10 go into a fund that would go for fishing because our fishing has not been as good as it has been in the last 15 years. Now, you ask me how I know that is that I made a survey, I don't know how many times at the fishing club in the last five years, how many people are catching more fish this year than they did five years ago? Zero. Maybe a couple of guys, there's a couple of good fishermen that uh, know how to catch them and they got them, they're chumming and they're feeding them and they know where they exactly live. But for the most part, most people, that, they don't catch very many fish. There's a lot of people that fish and the people catch one or two fish those fish get sore lips from the hooks, and they don't bite for a while. It is pretty difficult. Some a middle lake, we have a lot of little fish, but uh, some people say well, there's a lot of fish in there, but there's not. We need to have some forage for those fish. A lot of the fish are being caught at Calero, for example, the, the prettiest lake, and they're skinny, and they're dying, and they need more forage, which means we need to put crayfish or other fish in there. But my, going back to my solution, everyone that comes in here and fishes should have to pay a $10 license fee. This is simple. Now, when you pay the $10, you get a little sticker or you get something that you hang on your shirt, and anyone that comes here and they don't belong here and they don't have a sticker, the security can go right up to them and say, where's your, uh, your license fee? License. I don't have one. Goodbye. And who let you in? Oh, Jay Solomon let me in. Well, let's find him 50 bucks or $100. I mean, let's find somebody. I'll tell you what, you find somebody once, you find somebody once, it'll be all over. The word will get out. They're finding those people for coming. And I actually saw a website, it hasn't been recent, four or five years ago, how to get into Rancho Marietta fishing. They actually had a website that did that. And I'm not kidding, and I didn't make that up. It's not there anymore. I can't find it. But I, I, I know that somebody, one of the uh, people that lived here, Tree Plum Tree, he made a comment on it. If you try to sneak in a Rancho Maria and they catch you, it's a big fine. But I never heard of anyone being fine. Thanks, Ozzy. But I think, I think if you, any boat that comes in here, and that's a problem, they need to get a $10 sticker list like I do, and I, and I live here, and they, had, they need to get a $10 fishing license, and they need to put it into a fund so we can get it back to get some forage fish. That's all I have to say. It's simple. And the security, I'll say, where's your license? I don't have one. Out. And who let you in? Joe Blow. He lets you in? Then he's going to get a fine. Thank you for hearing me. Please, please watch the clock. We, we do have a lot of people who want to talk this evening. Is, is there a fine for people who let residents in or guests in Pardon? and they don't accompany them? You know, if, if there's a guest that they let in and they don't accompany them, what do we do now? They should be fined. They should be fined? Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, you need Don Klein, uh, lot 348. 
And quick question, if people show up and they were unaware they had to have their lot number, are they not allowed to speak? <laughs> Your address will work fine. Okay, well, I knew my lot number. Anyways, so um, I'm up here trying to be proactive and not reactive. Um, we've been out here about a year. We absolutely love this place, um, but really, but are really, really noticing that um, people treat a lot of the roads out here like freeways. Um, most specifically, we bought a beautiful house on Para, and we've called it the Para Freeway. It's got this delightful little hump that even lets you get faster right before you get to Escuela, where all the little kids are going and the gigantic deer are running across the street, um, where the carts, you know, park to turn to take their dogs up to run, and then the people pass them on the right and on the left. Um, it's terrifying. I don't let my child play in the street. And I tell them not to go into the street. But, you know, young kids still learning, impulse control, <gasps> a ball. And somebody that would have been doing 25 would have been able to stop. Somebody that's now doing 45 can't stop. And they've drugged my kid or the buck with six points all the way down to Guadalupe. Um, so specifically for me, I would love for the board to look into the problem on my street find a solution and implement it. Um, but being said, there's a much bigger problem on a lot of the other streets. I'm not advocating something on every street out here. I don't want to be in everybody's business, but they have to get out there and look and listen to the people that are letting them know that they have constant excessive speeding. And so many people consider the stop signs out here just suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> and it just helps them get that speed going where they're supposed to be going 25. They're just, they're disregarding all of it. And if we can put some things into place that will calm the speed down, force them to just get at a speed that's gonna be safe for the intersections and areas they're gonna be at, I think we can prevent a tragedy. We've been very lucky, as I understand out here, not having a lot of auto peds, not having a lot of auto deer, but it just takes that one time to ruin a whole bunch of lives, so. I'm hoping to hit this before we have to do that. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, ju just a, a note for you. Um, this, this may ease, no, it, that's fine, thank you. Uh, this may ease a little bit of your concerns. This board and, and the, the members of our community today are obviously very concerned about speeding and we're I've been trying to be very proactive in dealing with that. And Jim is on the uh, compliance committee and, and he's diligently working about, uh, on issues. And I can tell you for a fact that uh, almost three years ago I was elected to the board and my first comment was about uh, speeding and uh, stop sign violations. Um, can I just say, add one Absol thing? Absolutely. Okay, because specifically to her, she was talking about where Escuela meets Para. Right. Mm -hmm. I also, I had known somebody that lived there, and she, her main concern was when the kids come off Escuela on their skateboards or their bicycles, mm -hmm. you know, they run into the road there, and you know, and so I think that would be one area we would really want to look at some preventative things. Mm -hmm. Just that, because that, it, it's the gateway to our main park. Mm -hmm. And there is a huge hill coming into Para off. Um, I'd, I'd also like to suggest that maybe if, if a speaker before you has already kind of addressed the same thing you plan on addressing, that you could make it a little more brief. Um, I'd like to hear from every one of you, but I don't want to, to have breakfast here. <laughs> You're up. Uh, thanks. My name is Matt Brennan and uh, 6945 Domingo Court. Um, first of all, I, I, again, it was speeding. It's also creating a noise issue as well. Um, but uh, as she had said, I'm trying to be a little bit more proactive. One of the things is, is that this isn't a security issue. The security department does a great job. The <laughs> chief's doing a wonderful job. This doesn't fall under their authority. Um, one of the things is, is that the reason that speeding is so bad here, and I'll tell you I'm a former police officer, is that inside here is the only place people know that they're not going to get stopped by the sheriff's department or the highway patrol. It's the only place you know you can speed and run stop signs because there is no true enforcement. 
So my idea is to, in cooperation with the Sheriff's Department, is I think we need to have some, a little bit of a blitz. Um, and my thought process is to bring the traffic unit out. Um, they have authority, we pay taxes to have that police presence and that, and one of the ways to do it is that the, let them come out and run some traffic enforcement, but the first time is that they should have a letter from like the board and from the residents saying, the reason you're being stopped today and you know, as a community we're concerned. We're not trying to get a whole bunch of tickets written and, and, and generate revenue. It's just knowledge. And just like that gentleman said, one person gets a ticket, the whole world will slow down dramatically. The first time they pass the motorcycle police officer has somebody pulled over, it's going to grab everyone's attention. I don't think that it needs to be um, something more than that, but I do believe that some enforcement and, co and a cooperation where the community is, is backing it. Not just CSD wants to bring them in or the board, but the community wants enforcement and I think is a great way to start. And again, a, a, a simple letter that they hand out to the person, you know, this is from the community. We want you to know this. This wouldn't forego if they had a warrant for their arrest or some kind of violation where the officer felt that a ticket was warranted. So be it. That's kind of my thought. Uh, there's also traffic calming methods that don't cost a lot of money. Uh, many of them are just uh, visual um, things that uh, it's painted, things that look like a speed bump. They're not speed bumps. They don't cost the money to enforce them. But it's just the paint on the road. Yeah, the first time you go over it and you, don't, and you realize that's fine. But it keeps the person on their cell phone or the person that's not paying attention. They'll see that and it'll, even though they know it's not a speed bump, they'll act accordingly. So um, it's just some thoughts on and maybe even creating maybe a committee where we can all come together and come up with some really good ideas on how to do this at an inexpensive cost, um, again, before it, I try to avert a, a tragedy. Because it's, I live uh, right on um, right Marietta Parkway and it's a free-for-all. And I used to run enforcement and I'm telling you that cars are doing 50, 60 miles an hour. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Sure. And uh, I, I, I might add to that that they, they also paint cattle guards across roads in the Midwest to keep cows from, mm -hmm. yeah. from, yep. from crossing the road. So uh, there, there may be a correlation there somewhere. I think cows are smarter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Janice Wister, I don't really, I think it's 3031. It's not something I remembered, <laughs> to, but I think it is. De La Cruz Drive, anyway. Um, this is just pretty much to bring up the attention now that they were starting to talk about the speeding and that. This is one particular incident that has happened to me so many times and I'm afraid somebody's going to get really hurt. Um, I go up and down Marietta Parkway a lot. I'm a walker. I walk across 16. I do it many times a week. And I get up there, I push the button to say I want to be able to have the ability to walk across the street safely. I wait for the little white sign to say you may do so but the problem is you have everybody coming to make a right turn out of Rancho Marietta and they do not stop I've almost got hit 20 times and I will tell you I am so concerned about these young kids if I got somebody next to me waiting for me I'm telling him do not go until you look and make sure that there's nobody coming and these guys and I have to say guys because I've never had this happen to me with a woman but they go whipping out of here, and I'm looking at this thing that says I can walk, and I start, and they look at me, and I go this, and they give me all kinds of harassment, very nasty words, windows, you know, and I've had, I, I, it's really very upsetting for me to do that, and I'm just afraid somebody's going to get hit, because they're going, they don't stop. And when this was first instituted, the red light, I mean, a red light making a, a right turn, you, you first of all couldn't do it then then you must stop before you go and make the right turn nobody's doing that. not 90 percent of the people are not doing that they're in a hurry to get to work or whatever they're just going right out and never they're not stopping at all and I'm just saying this just to make it maybe I don't know what maybe somebody that's in the police force or whatever or the security has a solution to this but either cameras need to be there to see the people who are doing this or something 
some kind of a, a citation or something. Somebody has to be watching this thing, because, this area, because somebody's going to get hit. So, I Thanks, just Jan. wanted to Jan, uh, my suggestion for you is to uh, put that down in a letter and send it to the, the county sheriff, the Sacramento County Sheriff. Oh. They actually have more jurisdiction in that area you're talking about. Okay. Uh, because it's a, it's a uh, state highway. Okay, but it's still coming, they're still coming out of Rancho. Yep. It's not well, that's right. yep. I'll make it short since um, a lot of what other people have said is exactly what I'm going to talk about. Um, my name is Mariah Abraham. I live on Para. I have no idea what my a lot number is, 6,800 Para. Um, I've lived out here eight years. I have six kids. I'm an avid runner in the community, and um, Para Speedway, as um, I don't know you, Don, um, um, is gotten worse and worse in the last eight years that I've been here. Um, the biggest concern I have for Para, um, not necessarily Escuela because, well, I mean, it's still a major issue, but um, where they put that new path going around to the um, back new little park there on um, Stonehouse, I don't know what they're calling it right now, but um, that's where our mailbox is. And so kids come down the pathway and can't stop because it is a hill and they hit the um, hit para. Do you know where I'm talking about exactly? That's where our mailbox is. Kids come flying down there. Of course, they're trying to stop. It's not that they're not trying to stop, but people are flying down the street. Um, it is a matter of time and it's going to be a total tragedy and I it makes me scared every time I go to the uh, mailbox because I see kids doing that or even joggers or um, people with dogs and whatever and they think that they can cross and somebody's coming way too fast. Um, probably the majority of the community knows who I am because I'm out there yelling. When, when they pass <laughs> my street, I'm throwing my arms out. Um, I, the other problem I have is, um, and I know this isn't totally the topic, but um, golf carts driving on the bike lane and driving in excessive speed. I run up the parkway probably four times a day. I'm sorry, not four times a day, four times a week. And um, people are hauling down. They refuse to move. Um, I'm running with whether my dog or my children, um, and they are coming down in excessive speeds. Um, people not paying attention in their cars driving down the parkway. It's essentially two lanes going down the parkway. It's extremely wide. They do not need to be over in the pedestrian lane. Um, the other issue that I have as far as a lady just spoke about turning on to Jackson um, from um, Ranch Marietta Parkway, that also happens um, the two Guadalupe's and what are the other street. They're looking left while they're turning right and I even though I have my headphones in and I'm running up the parkway, I'm looking at them with my arms up because I know that they don't see me and they just roll right through the stop sign and they're looking left and they're turning right. So, um, and they're on their yeah. Um, so <laughs> the speeding, but my biggest concern, I really feel like we need undulations. They have it at the only two country clubs I know that have it, um, um, Stockton Country Club and Brookside Country Club. People don't speed there. There's two undulations on every main street. You can't, whether it's your golf cart or your car, you can't speed there because those speed bumps will spill your drink and um, everything else. Um, but as far as also on para with the um, sidewalk or the walkway there by the mailboxes, there's got to be either flashers, um, those flashes that they have like by um, grade schools or undulations or something. A stop sign, people are not going to do anything with a stop sign. They don't currently, yeah. they're not going to stop for a stop sign. So something that is going to slow them down would be the best. Thank Thanks. you. Um, that, we refer to that as para path even though it, it goes on down through the wooded area and the open area is still Para Path on the other side of, of Para. And, and, and I thought I recognized you. You're the one that keeps trying to tell me to slow down when I'm running my Segway down that <laughs> ramp. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Denise Hayes, and I'm sorry, I don't know my lot either, but it's 6079 Puerto. 
and it's a beautiful street. And I want to first say thank you to the board and to um, CSD because I have emailed and you have replied and you are doing something about the speeding. And I now have seen that there is a, a speed kind of like trap thing that's telling you what, how fast you're going um, on Puerto. Um, I, like the mother before, um, am concerned on our street. It's a wonderful street, but there is an, an area where there's a blind spot. So we are on Puerto and Park 17. Our house sits there, and there's mailboxes across the way. And as cars are coming down Puerto, let's say they're heading down to Rio Blanco, okay? There's that stop there. They're coming down, they're coming very fast. If you are at the mailbox, there's no way you're gonna have time to get out of the way, especially if you're gonna walk across the street to our driveway, you're gonna get hit. Let alone, we are constantly seeing cars blow that stop sign and golf carts. And there's, there's a baby that lives in that house right there. There's a teacher that just retired her husband's trucks right there. It just takes one back out and bam. And it's just accidents waiting to happen. And Don and I happen to be friends. We both didn't realize that we both have these issues on our streets and we both just happen to be bringing this up all at the same time. But our sons are here, and one of their friends also, that they also live on a very busy street, Guadalupe, which cars speed up and down there as well. And our other friends that are out of town live on Guadalupe that lead into Para, and it's just, we need some change, please. And I don't know, I don't think the stop signs are going to do it. I do believe in speed humps. There's a difference between humps and bumps. Um, and maybe it's closer to a stop sign, something. Because I know everybody doesn't like how it looks, but I think we kind of have to get over the look and we have to think about the safety. So again, thank you for replying back to my emails and I'm excited that we're gonna do something. I believe that we'll do something and I'm happy to help come up with some solutions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. John, you've already had three minutes. I know. <laughs> I, I live at lot 723 because I know that lot number. When I got here, we did not have mailboxes. And the, uh, the first chief of security, Jim Noller, delivered my mail. Okay. I, I just want to point out to you, I want to point out to you a couple of things. First of all, you're talking about the same things they were talking about in 1986. Uh, but secondly, you've had, an, you've had a major demographic shift in the community uh, where you had these problems in 86, but half the people had a white Cadillac. They went to the club. That was their primary source of entertainment. Only 35% of those people do it now. And they had a couple of drinks. They down, didn't want enforcement. I went to meetings where people told me that they didn't want enforcement because it, it, it hurt their bar trade, okay? So, so the, 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 the other issue I want to point out to you that you need to engage going forward is we're spending about the same amount of money on security now that we were in 1990. We have a bond issue that governs how much we can spend. It escalates by approximately 2% a year. So it's the only number that says static. Now we have multiple cars, we have driveway parking, we have a demographic shift. All the kids in 1986 to 1990 went out of here on one school bus. All of them, whether they were high school, going to CRES, they all went out on one bus. We have the same two cars. We added a car and we added security support when we opened the south gate. We operate with the same amount of people now than we did then. We operate with the same amount of money that we did then. And the, in addition to try and stop the speeding problem, which is age old and needs to be stopped, and looks like there's finally some people that are gonna attempt to make it happen, you've got the rest of the security function that you're trying to deal with. You've got Jay out there who wants him to keep from stealing his fish. You got people, you got people, you got people answering complaints. You got people dealing with the highway patrol and the sheriff to assist in an observe and report capacity and bring those people in for domestic problems. One thing you notice when you read the reports is the gates themselves seem to work well because all the problems are already locked inside. <laughs> the problems don't essentially as a percentage come from the outside, the problems come from the inside. So structurally I think the thing's broken 
And I think as you, as you attack the speeding problem with your two new guns, that's a great thing, and maybe somebody stops letting them all go after you catch them, uh, then maybe somebody ought to really start to focus on the structure and the financial aspects of security and whether you want police patrols like just gentlemen, the, the, the Sacramento Sheriff will tell you that they will not do what this gentleman wants them to do. You have to pay them, you have to pay them as off-duty sheriffs to do it. We can do that. We can do anything you want. We did a survey not too long ago that said people want all of this stuff. And the last question tells us distinctly that they don't want to pay for it. So you've got disconnects here you need to deal with. We're going to do the same thing tomorrow night. We'll get a little bit more organizationally, I hope, into the structure of it. But I think that's the real issue here. You can't really, you can say, oh, we're going to solve all these problems. But you're, you're working with a finite amount of money and a finite amount of manpower. And until you restructure that, and we're becoming a town. When Sullivan gets through here, we're going to have 10,000 people. So I, I think that's another area of this that you really have to, you have to focus in on. Did you, did you count the, uh, the accessory uh, uh, buildings? No, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but, but what they do now with those, you know, you'll be out there because you'll have fires, because the way they get around it now is they build them not as an accessory dwelling, but as a pool house, and then they put in a microwave oven and a hot plate. Thank you, John. Good evening. Hi. I'm Stephen Grant. I live on Para as well. I don't know my <laughs> lot number. That's all right. It's like, a pass it's like a password, right? You just forget it. Um, but I've lived out here 12 years, and when I moved out here, a friend of mine told me, you know, you're going to have a lot of traffic here on the weekends. Yeah, it's okay. I can deal with that on the weekends. But it seems for 12 years now, it's been every day. And uh, it's been speeding every day down Para. I'm on 6806 right next to Mariah. And... Uh, Again, I understand that it is a safety issue and trying to be proactive. But also, um, I worked from home today and I'm at my dining table looking out towards Para. And you can hear everyone that speeds fast because speed just has a sound, right? Mm -hmm. So the first sound that I hear is an RMA truck going down. <laughs> so he was probably doing about 35, probably. Then about 4 o'clock, there's a CSD vehicle, one of the patrol cars, <laughs> flying towards the gate, and he, he or she was doing probably about 45. No, no lights on, no nothing, you're just cruising down para pretty fast. And when you see those cars flying down the street, hey, they can do it, we can do it, right? And I'm with Mr. Fisherman here. You hit them in the pocketbook and start flying at people. I mean, we get fined for parking our cars, two or three cars in the driveway, and I, I get it. But the safety, no one's going to get killed if you got two cars parked in your driveway. Someone is going to get killed eventually. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. I would like to thank all of you for showing up tonight. And I can, I can tell you that we will take your comments seriously. And this is not a, a lighthearted uh, uh, problem that we have and we are definitely going to address the issue um, one more gentleman here Carl Gaither lot 441 I've been here for uh, 15 years and everything that's been spoken about running the stop signs and speeding same same issue nothing's changed don't know what you can do another subject uh, over in the south, uh, they're starting the, the beginning of a dog park. Um, I don't know exactly how that is coming about, but what I've seen so far doesn't seem to be uh, a very good thing. Uh, it was leveled out. It was a pump track at one time. They leveled it out, and then about two months later, there was a, a lot of debris, and I have to call it that, that was piled up in about five different piles. And then after that, I saw local neighborhood people in there with the golf carts and their own rakes and they're smoothing it all out and distributing these piles. And I went over and took a look at the piles. May I walk up to the board here for a moment, please? Say yes. Thank you. 
and um, <laughs> and uh, we, that, we will address the dog park issue a little later in the in I the didn't agenda. realize it was on the agenda and thank it you is. and that is the junk that is in the dog park and I have two dogs um, I wouldn't bring them into that dog park uh, where they run and skid around and chase each other um, the, the small stuff that is in the little bag there it's going to produce slivers and sores in the foot. The other one, the pups or our older dogs are going to pick it up and run with it and chew it. They're going to get splinters in the mouth. And so there are two water inlets there, one on the north side and one in the center, center south. And I'm wondering why that cannot be uh, piped and a lawn put in. A lawn is safe. Um, yes, you have to keep it green. Uh, but this What's in there right now for the cover is not for my dog, and I don't think for anybody else's dog, uh, let alone the dust that is being created when they run through there and breathe that. Unless you guys want to pay for vet bills, I don't know. My dogs aren't going to go in there. Anything positive about what's going on, what I just said? Absolutely. Carl, um, Greg, would you like to address that since it's later yeah, in the agenda? Basically, Carl, that's um, homemade chips is what we get from chipping the trees uh, in the common areas. And our plan is, is to put that in for the summer months and in September go in and put the lawn in. Uh, we don't have the manpower. We don't want to plant uh, grass in the middle of the summertime. And so we're putting this in as a temporary surface and then in September get the irrigation and get the lawn going. Is there going to be uh, shade trees? That's yeah, an I, open area. Yeah, I think we've got some benches already. We've got those already ordered and up at the shop, and uh, we'll get some, some two. So there'll be young trees starting now. It's going to be years before they provide much shade, but yeah, there will be some, some younger trees, 15 gallon trees put in. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can I ask you one question, please? What street do you live on, please? Pardon me? What street do you live on? Arbierto. Okay, thank you very much. Lot 441. Okay. Larry, may I make a comment? Absolutely. About okay. Um, I apologize, I've been sick, so I prepared a statement uh, just to read about the speeding issue. As some of you may know, I spent a large portion of my career in trauma. I'd like to ask of the people in this room, how many of you have seen a child involved in a blunt traumatic in incident, either a car versus a um, pedestrian or a bike versus a car? Okay. How many of you have then tried to save that child's life? How many of you had then had to tell the parents or loved ones that these children are not going home with their loved ones? I have, and I know there's a couple other people in the audience that have more children and families than I could possibly remember. If you cannot already tell, this is something that I'm very passionate about as a mother and as a health care provider. We need to do everything in our power to keep our children safe. The status quo is unacceptable. Personally, I've had a drunk driver run into a tree near my home. This driver nearly missed my home and the room where I put my son to sleep. Why is this acceptable in our community? Why do we not have higher expectations? I have witnessed 15 cars in 45 minutes speed well over the speed limit down the street, on my street, in one night alone. Again, I ask, what are we doing to intervene? Unfortunately, there are no gray areas when it comes to people's lives. It's black and white. The speed limit is 25. A stop sign is just that. Moving violations on our CCNRs need to be enforced within our gates, just as they would be anywhere else on any other street. We are not immune to the rules once we drive within Rancho Marietta gates. As a board, mem board member, I refuse to sit idly by and let our children be at risk when they are viable solutions to these problems. The median age for blunt pediatric trauma, meaning uh, trauma auto versus pedestrian or auto versus bike or whatever is 13 years old. That means there's younger kids, that's the median age. 42% of these incidences are pedestrians or bicyclists. We all know most accidents occur within a mile of our home. What I'd like to see is all options on the table. I would like to see an action plan from RMA as well as CSD to identify problem areas and implement action plans in each of these areas. We need an action, we need an action, we need to do something before there are any incidents with any of our children. I will tell you from my experience, none of us sitting in this room want to be the family in the trauma bay, nor do we want this to happen on our watch. 
and I implore my fellow directors as well as the CSD directors to act immediately. Thank you. And just for clarification, what street do you live on? <laughs> I live on Agua Vista, but we back up to Camino del Lago. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. And um, as you can see, uh, the board's passionate about this. Um, so we are going to now um, begin our board meeting in an official way. Um, <laughs> Not, not, not that we took anything you said lightly, but uh, I'm going to actually skip public comments because we've already had uh, just about everything that I could have in that in that sentence anyway. That paragraph. Okay, we will um, at, at a request of uh, one of the staff members who can't handle a lot of pressure. <laughs> we're going to take a five-minute break.
back okay? You're back okay. Oh, hopefully it is. You're back okay. just been informed <laughs> that as many people as were here for speeding, there's probably even more people here that are concerned about pickleball. <laughs> and, 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 and I actually thought that we had solved that problem, <laughs> but I guess not. So, so, so before we get into what we're really here for, let's talk about pickleball. Who would like to, who would like to address the, the board? Let's start it off. Uh, my name is Tom Burkhardt, my lot number is 3125. I want to thank you all for the pickleball courts you gave us. They're used extensively. Uh, we have 41 active pickleball players. You know, you can only play eight at a time on the two courts. So what we're here to do is ask you to consider giving us the other half of the basketball court. Ultimately, it'd be great to build new ones with better access for the players because the way it's set up now, you can go around, but if you build two pickleball courts, they're going to be cutting through courts to get to the vacant one. Okay? So pickleball, and pickleball is a very social uh, game. Uh, we have drop-ins scheduled for women on Mondays and Thursdays. For men, it's Tuesdays and Fridays, and everybody comes out on Saturdays. We have as many as 30 people coming out on a Saturday morning with eight people playing at a time. So there's long waits in between. The bad part about that is you get stiff, you go out, you try to play again, you get injured. It happens a lot in pickleball when there are long wait times. So what we would like to do is have the board consider at some point, I know you can't act on it today because it's not on the agenda, to take the other half of the basketball court and put in two new, two additional pickleball courts. So we have a total of four. That will allow us to uh, play more frequently with less wait time, plus we can do social events, potlucks, we can even have some tournament style events going with four courts. Hard to do with two courts. Um, how, do, how do you think that would, if, if we fenced off the, the other half of that basketball court, how do you think that would uh, shut off access to, to the, the whole uh, park area and people would have a, a longer distance to walk around? Is that, do you see that as a problem at all? I don't, I don't think so, because people go around the outside of the one side, and the other side, there's still more concrete on the other side of the basketball court. So I don't think it will restrict any okay. traffic flow. Would that eliminate basketball being able to be played? No, there will be a full court next door, because oh, okay. right. right now there's one and a half. Okay. There were two, we, we got half. There will be a full court there, plus the court up here at the gazebo. Okay. Greg, could we um, put make a note to put that on the goals committee on the goals agenda? How's that sound? The goals is what we plan on what we're going to do next year. Oh, this year. 
new budget, though. A new budget. Yeah. This year's goal meeting, goals meeting, will be what we do next year. This year. <laughs> okay, Booth, there may be some others that wanted to speak. You wanted me to talk about the health benefits. All right. My name is Steve Mayer, and I'm at uh, Lot 720. And, uh, yeah, I'm a senior citizen, I think. And I love pickleball. You know why I love pickleball? Because it keeps me healthy. Before, Tom, about three years ago, got us over there to experience pickleball. Well, most of us didn't even know what the word meant. Uh, I didn't do squat. I was, uh, I was real sedentary. Uh, wife tried to get me out walking. I hate walking. My wife tried to get me out doing health club. I hate health club, okay, because it's boring. Pickleball is great. So for a lot of us, especially seniors, we don't do stuff we don't like to do. And if you like to do it, you're going to continue to do it because doing it just once or twice doesn't do you much good. You got to do it consistently. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the health part of it because I think we need more players and more people in Rancho Marietta to know about the health benefits of something like pickleball because they're going to like it. They get out there, it's not like walking and doing all that stuff. I mean, this is good, fun exercise and it's for more than just the physical aspect of it. I happen to be an RN, uh, so I, I was taught uh, in school, I was taught about holistic medicine, and that means that we have a real connection between our bodies and our mind and our spirit. And I think a lot of times we think only of, you know, cardiac and cardiovascular and all of the other uh, joint health and what have you, and that's real important. And that's one of the things that I find in pickleball that has really, really helped me, really helped. But there's a lot of other parts of what we call homeostasis, which is a real healthy person. And that is your emotional part and, and the spiritual part. A lot of us sit around and we don't do things. We become sedentary because, well, frankly, we get depressed, we're anxious. We, we just, we don't do the things we want because uh, I know I should go out and walk, or I know I should go out and run, or I know I should go down there and do some work at the, but I don't want to. So you don't do it, and you become sedentary and become depressed because you know you should, but you don't. The other thing is, especially as we get older, we tend to have more periods of isolation where you don't have friends, you don't have people that you can do things with. Let me tell you. You come out and play pickleball, you're not going to be depressed. And you're going to make friends like you never believed. Uh, people, when they play pickleball, am I talking too loud? Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just get, yeah, I see. Okay, time's up, get the hook, I'm leaving. But. You know, this is, there's one thing I just want to say. We want to be proactive. We want to bring more people out to play in pickleball. And uh, if we could, through websites or whatever other means that we're going to have, we're going to have an even bigger problem when it comes to the population that uh, we're dealing with now. And we want those people out there because we want them to get healthy, just like me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question? <laughs> Yes, ask them. I have a quick question about pickleball. Yeah. Um, can the courts be used when they're not in use by people playing pickleball? No, <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. I've been on it many times, and I, and I don't even know who I am. There are fences around it. fence around it. Wait, what, um, what? There's a fence around it, it's, and it's really supposed to be used just for pickleball. Yeah. Oh. Are you guys still using the South Courts? Yes, sometimes. Okay, we have a new speaker. Uh, 
Uh, Jamie Fox, lot 2009. I'm going to address exactly what you said because as much as we'd love to have two more courts, I think we need to protect the ones that we're on. Um, I have seen boys in baseball uniforms run from the playground and climb over the chain link, stopped by four very livid women in the other court. Um, I've seen a little girl running around the court with her grandfather watching from the outside. Um, I said that the courts were for pickleball only, and I got from him a bunch of guff. Not now, they're not, blah, blah, blah. I said to him, he needs to set an example, not be part of the problem. I, we, four of us, ran into a father and his two-year-old playing in one of the empty courts, and the two-year-old was jumping on, uh, pulling on the net. Mm -hmm. um, we said, he can't do that. That particular man has a history of kind of unstable behavior and came back at us with you know, some paperwork. On food truck Sundays, I've seen kids running into the courts with basketball and commencing to start uh, playing some kind of game with the net. I've seen kids on scooters, and you can see the scratches on the courts. Um, when we played on the south, we even find dog feces in the court. <laughs> so my question is that why are the pickleball courts and tennis courts not given the same respect as the golf course? because it's still a sport. Um, if the kids did to the golf course what they do to the courts, I imagine there'd be a huge hue and cry. So I, my solution is that it would help if we had more signage, specific signage. We have a sign there, but it is very general. And so I've done a um, little bit of research and have not only come up with something to substantiate Substantiate Steve's uh, health. I made a hand, hand out for you guys about the benefits of p pickleball. But I've also made, um, if I could submit them to you, <coughs> some sign ideas. I did research uh, on, you know, on the web, tennis court, you know, just tennis court signs. And I worked this up. The problem is there seems to be an arrogance that's going on in this community that I don't remember, you know, from 30 years ago. And it's that a lot of parents don't care, whether it's the kids in the street or um, kids left in golf carts. And they need to lead by example. Not only, you know, be aware of what their kids are doing, but what they're doing to other things. So with that in mind, do you mind if I submit this to you? And, um, you know, it would really, really help us to have signs mm -hmm. and signs on every side of the court. Because this is an investment, and um, let's take care of it. You know, we put a newsletter out every month, uh -huh. and we've never really addressed this particular problem. I didn't realize it was so rampant. Mm -hmm. So it'd be interesting to see what you're going to give us with information, and maybe we can start to communicate some things about that. Yeah. Um, it's the, you know. Here. I'd like to actually offer an opposing view. I know it may not be a popular view, um, but I think all of us in this community, we all pay dues to use every portion of the community equally, uh, whether it's kids, adults, grandparents, whatever age. Um, and I think to restrict access for certain reasons, it's just like saying people that aren't playing softball can't use the softball fields, or people that aren't playing soccer can't play, can't play on the soccer fields. I just think it's really restrictive. I understand the need to keep the pickleball courts nice and the nets nice. I get that. Me personally, when I was growing up, I used tennis courts when it was raining outside and we needed to practice softball. So maybe that wasn't appropriate use, but if we weren't bothering anybody. Well, you could argue that two different ways. I beg to differ. It was a great learning um, style for me, so I, I think that we need to consider this further. You're probably very well behaved, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, I um, do know. I, you know the ten, the, I agree with them that these are like tennis courts. These nets are fragile. They wear out. I think if they're misusing them, they shouldn't be in there. I, I don't know.
Thank you. Thank you. Would you, uh, would you move to the microphone, please? Um, what do you suppose the uh, gentlemen that play golf would say to their children who were running all over the uh, golf, golfing area? Well, I will tell you what I would do personally. I know that I try and keep very good control of my kids, but I can tell you. Well, you're one in very well, no, but few. What I'm say, you're one in very few of this what I community. Can say is my children still get away from me and do things that I don't intend for them to do. So, it's not we're, always intentional. Excuse me. We're we're really kind of talking about a, a couple of different things, and and the board is not going to be able to take an action on any of it. But you, you're comparing things that really aren't comparable when. You're comparing an open tennis court or an open pickleball court to a golf course where people are paying dues to use. This is an open court available for the community, and we can't start locking it up as soon as you guys walk off of it. That's just not going to be a practical operation. We can try and control vandalism and misuse, and, and that we will address. Uh, but. Well, I, I'm, I'm not in favor of abuse of anything. I'm not suggesting that at all. And, and, and that, but that's not the issue. And, okay, and, and recognize that we're not in a position to act or react to what you're giving us here, because it's really not on our agenda. We're being kind of, kind of cooperative to listen to you and, and understand your issues. And we will, as a board, certainly address those. But, but we, have, we have no solution at the moment, and we have no, no uh, ability to move forward. Well, I'll tell you, you know, take your little leaguers over there and uh, the little league moms and what have you, send some golfers over there and start throwing some chicken on their, their outfield, and there's going to be some... We, un we understand that. We're not advocating that. Right. We're not suggesting that that happens. And, and what I'm suggesting is that this isn't on the agenda. And, and we need to get it on the agenda and discuss it openly to, to make that work. So if you guys will bear with us, we don't need your criticism at this point because we haven't done anything. Okay, thank you. What, what I would like to suggest to you is, is the next thing that we were going to do is Frisbee golf. And everybody can play that. You can walk the course. It's an 18-hole course. It's in the progress. We're going to talk about it later on the agenda if you'd like to come in and uh, sit in and, and listen to that discussion. And we hope to have that open uh, before winter. And uh, a fun thing to do. You, none whatsoever. You, you, it's 18 holes. It'll be in the Greens Park. You, you need uh, a, a few little Frisbees. And every one of these are different, by the way. There's a putter. There's a driver. Um, <laughs> But you can, uh, you can go out and play it at your free will. You can play it with groups. Uh, and there will literally be a, a driving range or a, a, a starting range and a hole that you can throw the frisbee to, 18 of them. And Where? just walking. Where? Greens Park. On the south. On the south. On the south. So just. I, I, Greens I, I, Park just, is the new park that we put in down in the south. This is here when we talk about it later, but I just thought that some of you might want to expand your activities and your, your uh, excitement to Frisbee golf. It's, uh, it's, it's appropriate for our age group, I can tell you that. Uh, <laughs> I play. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on to, to our regular agenda. And thank you for coming. We did? That's all right. Thank you. Uh, the agenda is posted online if you have any, uh, any way that you uh, want to uh, share what, what we're going to talk about. Um, so, um, Thank you. you're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, the, uh, we've given the public plenty of time to talk, so I'm not even going to go through that part. <laughs> first, first thing on the agenda is the consent calendar. And um, those items are considered routine and will be approved in one motion. And uh, there will be no discussion of these items unless a director specifically wants to remove one for discussion. Do I have any items on the consent counter that need to be removed? Uh, 
Uh, do I have a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the consent calendar. I'll second it. Uh, motion is uh, to approve this consent calendar is seconded. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? <coughs> Next item on the agenda is the uh, minutes of the June 19th committee meeting. Uh, and I think we've already kind of bounced that one around a little bit. Does uh, I have a motion? Make a motion to approve the minutes of Jan June 19th, 2018. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, sure, president's report. Um, actually, it says vice president's report. <laughs> The Board of Directors met in an executive session and approved minutes, legal vouchers, and reviewed various legal issues. The Board also initiated foreclosure proceedings against uh, Assessor Partial Number 1280310027000. And the next item on the agenda is the General Manager's Report. How's that for getting through half this thing in five minutes? I'll do mine in five minutes, too. <laughs> uh, the uh, Summerfield Sports Field update, uh, the uh, parking area for the field was paved on Friday, so the paving's done in that area. Uh, the grass is coming in nicely. Uh, we've got some trees ordered uh, to plant. And then uh, the ARC is going to be reviewing the uh, monument sign that will uh, recognize and, and show the field's name. Uh, the next item is the Riverview Dog, dog Park update. Uh, as the gentleman uh, noted, we have been hauling uh, the bark out. Uh, the Boy Scouts have been doing the spreading, um, and it's only a, a temporary coverage. Uh, we plan on September hopefully being able to get in there and get some irrigation and some grass in, um, but we were hoping to get some bark in so it could be used for the last couple of months of the summer. Uh, the modular restroom at Lake Clementia, you saw there's a memo there from the manufacturer. He's talking mid-August now. Uh, I guess they have had some construction delays, uh, but he's hoping there will be no more, and he's thanking us for our patience, which we haven't really been exhibiting. Uh, are we, are we, uh, are we uh, having a lottery as to who can use it first? Uh, <laughs> we, we, have not, we have not thought of that, but we could, we could maybe work on that. I, I guess ETC gets that honor, right? Say that, yeah. will, it, will it be done by, by the time of our August 11th concert, or is it later? Well, he's saying... Uh, He's just saying mid-August is what okay. completion We have delivery. another concert in September. Okay, so hopefully it yeah, will. There we go. Hopefully like that. I'd shoot for September. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping mid-July, but that didn't happen. <laughs> the fishermen will appreciate it. <laughs> uh, the next time, the, the Greens Park sidewalk, it is complete. And so if you haven't been out there, uh, I see a lot of kids riding their bikes and tricycles and big yeah. wheels. Uh, it, it makes a nice loop through the park. And so. No, it looks really good. Yeah, so I, I think it's going to be a nice asset. Yeah, you can go across the bridge. Uh, the next item is a Frisbee golf <laughs> course uh, by the Greens Park, and that is a board action. Uh, this has been a goal for many, many years by various boards. Uh, originally, we were envisioning two 18-hole courses, one on the north, one on the south. One is going to be at the Marietta Parkway site, the other one at the Greens Park. Uh, we put it on hold until the Greens Park was completed. Uh, earlier this year, I contacted uh, Charlie Callahan. He's a, a designer. And so he did uh, preliminary designs for two 18-hole courses, uh, one on the north, one on the south. Uh, Charlie's a big believer in site meetings um, with the uh, uh, different parties to make sure everybody's on the same page. And so myself, uh, Rod Hart, and uh, Larry, Jim, and uh, Alex, Alex. Uh, we did a walk with the, uh, the designer. And after walking the two courses in discussion, uh, the recommendation from that group was that we only do one 18-hole course, that being at the Greens. Uh, we felt it had more obstacles, uh, mm -hmm. it just had a better layout uh, for the Frisbee golf course. And if at a later date we find we have a, a people are really excited about it, we could add the one on the north. And so the recommendation tonight is to um, pay $1,000 for the design and then $9,000 for the concrete and uh, the, another $2,000 to construct the launch pads. I'm sorry, $9,000 for the, the baskets and tees and $2,000 for construction of the launch pads. So the total cost would be $12,000. Uh, 
Uh, in my recommendation, I had that we could use exclusive use fees. Uh, but after talking to Colleen, we also have some operating funds uh, from the table, cable TV, um, the Greenfield contract. Since we reorganized that contract last year, we're going to have about a $20,000 surplus uh, in that account. And so the 12000 could be used from this year's operating budget instead of using the exclusive use fees. And so the recommendation is to approve the design installation of one 18-hole Frisbee golf course at the Greens Park uh, to be funded from the operating account at a cost of $12,000. No. Any questions? Um, I'd, I'd just like to make a comment. At first, when we first started talking about this earlier in the year, we were going to temporarily use the funds that we had set aside for the Esquello um, um, Passive Gate, which we're not going to have to do now since uh, this uh, exclusive use funds has popped up. And I thank you for finding that. That keeps our Squallow Gate funding intact without messing that up. So that's a, that's a good, that's a positive thing. And uh, I'm excited about this. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, the board uh, will entertain a motion. Make a motion to approve the design and installation of one 18-hole Frisbee golf course at the Greens Park location. I'll second it. Uh, all in favor of the $12,000 expenditure, uh, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. We'll get the, I'll give Charlie the word and he'll get the layout done and then we'll, he'll probably be after the dog part before we start the Frisbee part. So. <laughs> Just don't make it after the pickleball court. <laughs> yeah, it might be the pickleball court, too. Okay. <laughs> uh, posts and cable at Stonehouse Park. Um, we started that. We've got about, uh, I think, about 80 posts in the ground, and so it's about halfway complete. Uh, so hopefully in another week, uh, the posts and cable will be, uh, be in the ground, and uh, at least the post will be, then we'll string the cable. And that's really going to be nice to be able to keep uh, control of the access going on to those fields. Uh, joint security meeting. Uh, there's a request or a suggestion by uh, President Shelton uh, that we uh, have a joint security meetings. Uh, they were held in the past uh, between the RMA, RMCSD, RMCC, Marietta Village, the villas, and uh, the, the commercial uh, people on, on the south side, on the, across the highway. Uh, we have every year appointed uh, members of that committee. Um, We've appointed Alex and Jim to the committee in 2018. Uh, like I say, it's probably been two or three years since that committee has met. And so I, I guess I'm just throwing out to the board to see if you guys uh, want to meet. And if so, I'll uh, get a notice out to the other groups to see if they're interested in meeting. I'd like to throw something out um, that we were discussing in the executive session, which was a very good point, is that both staff from CSD and RMA has already started talking regarding speeding and stop signs, getting that enforcement, trying to get on the same page. I'd like to continue with those meetings and hold off on including, and I don't want to disclude the villages, but the problems that we have are inside the gate and they have their own HOA over there. And that's my proposal. Um, one of the reasons that I brought this up and, and let me explain the, 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 a little bit. Um, I, I think it's a broader issue. I, I think the security we have, the, the security issues we have in this community are broader than just speeding and stop signs. And, and I, I, I think overall, the, we need to have this committee in place to address what, what we heard here tonight, the overall community worried about security and stop signs and moving violations and a lot of other issues. And, and I, I think that committee needs to address other things. The Esqualo gate keeps coming up and whether we have a man gate or a passive gate. Um, where are we going to get the funds for it? Where is CSD going to, going to get the operational costs? Um, and, and, and other um, means of, of patrolling the area um, are whether RMA is going to continue to have additional security staff here to write moving violations or write violations, and how this, the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department should be involved in our security issues. We pay taxes to the county just like every other person in this county, and I don't think that we're getting equal representation from the Sheriff's Office 
uh, appropriately for what we're paying. I'd like to add, too, that I, I do think that this committee should be reenacted, and I think that the country club should be part of it because there were questions coming up about, you know, some of the new programs that they have that allow people that don't live in the community to golf, and so that they're coming through the gate. There's, you know, the, the check system that is um, in, in place has not really been thoroughly implemented. I know um, there's just been difficulties with it. So I think um, I might agree that probably the, you know, the village is not as a con much of a concern, but obviously the villas, they have lots of cars that come in and out of our, our gates, and the country club should be involved in it also. And I would, I would agree with you, Larry, that it's more than just speeding and stop signs. You know, there are just issues of, of access, you know, coming in, messing around with the lakes and the kind of the problems that we're having with people bringing in boats that don't belong in here, um, those kind of things. So I would agree that I think it needs to be reenacted and I think it needs to meet fairly often right now to get some of these issues um, addressed and some kind of action plans put in place that will address a lot of these major issues. You know, you do bring up a good point because if uh, I think, um, what is it, Golf Now or Golf some of these outside sources where someone who is not a member. Go for golf, you go to golf, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If they come on our property and they do something, to have a violation, who do we send the fine to? Yeah. yeah. Is it gonna be the country club? I mean, I, I don't have an answer. And also the residents have to call in their guests. So yes. why wouldn't the why country wouldn't? club, it seems to me if they have tea time set, it should be they should have a guest oh, list just yeah. like we do. And send it over to I security. see Mike coming up to the podium, so I'd sure like to know what's going on with it. <laughs> well, you guys are going down a slippery slope. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, I like the security committee. Uh, that conversation is going to take a direction that maybe some on this board would not care for. Uh, golf now is definitely a temporary thing. Uh, but there's so many more people to come into this community um, that you'd be very surprised mm -hmm. of it. And it's, uh, it's uh, amazing. When you start talking about policies or speed limits or that kind of stuff there, it gets complicated. So I think that everybody needs to be involved. It also makes it public and where it's not a private conversation. And then everybody for themselves can see the issues that are coming forward. Uh, but it's a lot of complication. I'll give you a little quick history. I really, we brought back the security committee a lot. We enforced a security fee on all the new homes here to help put another tool into the process. The security is a tax, and there's a, a bunch of things that are attached, is attached that how different properties are assessed taxes for the amount of work that they're doing. I don't like speeding. I live on the most busiest road in here. They come racing down Guadalupe all the time. I get that. Uh, when my kids were younger, I would actually chase the cars hmm? <laughs> and let them know about speeding because I don't want my kids to be hit with a car. Did you ever catch any? <laughs> yeah, actually one. Actually, actually one, to be honest with you. But it's a complicated issue. Uh, I understand the concern about the, the, uh, the country club. Uh, I think every single event that we have out here uh, brings a lot of outside guests. And it's, uh, when you start getting into the policies, it's a good thing to start and to make sure that... Uh, that uh, because it's going to impact everything, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe mm -hmm. that's a good thing, but uh, it's well, a little bit more than, than uh, I think everybody's ready to uh, peel that onion, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things, Summerfest, is we don't sell any outside tickets to anybody. We don't. There is nothing you can buy. Only members and guests, they have to be on somebody's guest list or get a permission. Uh, we try to adopt that policy. That's not true to every single event that we got here. Uh, I'm a pretty good... Uh, study of all the different documents. I probably have every document in my garage. And uh, I would love for the country club to be involved in, in that kind of stuff there because there is issues. Yeah. You know, there mm -hmm. is issues with security um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, to me, they never fulfilled what they were supposed to do three years ago. Uh, they were supposed to come up with a study on every single incident that was supposed to, that involved in the community so you can track the incidents. I'm a little leery when they pull guns out of their pocket, they don't report them. Uh, in my business, I'm very worried about guns discharging and shooting people. Um, so there's a couple policies that I really tried to implement 
when I was involved in that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm a supportive of anything on the security stuff, but I, I, I think you should read some documents when you start getting into it because you might be trying to fix this problem and there's going to be some other issues that you're going to that you're going to run into. So, but I like the conversation. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And and I, I think based on the audience tonight and their concerns, we've got we've got to do something. We've got to move forward. Okay. Anything else? I think that's consensus. To <laughs> that's, yeah. that's your general consensus. Call the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm glad. Okay. <clears throat> so so. Um, the next item on the agenda is the different committees and the finance. The finance committee did not meet this month. We're trying not to spend any money, right, Pauline? <laughs> ARC, um, Architectural Review Committee, uh, we did meet um, uh, just once this month because we kind of skipped uh, uh, the area around July 4th. Um, we approved, uh, uh, well, we, we discussed uh, several driveway variances and uh, staff projects, and we would like to make a motion that uh, the committee approve common area leases for lot 221, uh, lot 839, lot 1525. These are all so, uh, lot, ownership changes. Lot 121 there, not 221. I'm sorry, that 121. And uh, uh, I'm making a motion for approval of those common area leases. I'll second that. Moved and seconded. Any uh, further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Mark, is have I covered things well enough? Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Compliance. Communication. Actually, I think it's communication. It's communication. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, communications committee did meet um, this month, and so we uh, went over some of the things that we have accomplished during the year, and we didn't have any residents who had come to the committee with uh, problems, so. Um, basically, uh, we talked about how the um, sports games have gotten fixed and some call center issues. And uh, we did talk about the Porto Drive, and we had a meeting even before the Communications Committee on Porto Drive. And uh, I know he's not here, but I want to talk, uh, thank Rod for um, explaining the different issues as far as road work and for setting up a January planning meeting with Greenfield on those. And um, let's see, uh, one of our committee members wanted me to check in to expanding the email capacity of ranchomerida.org. And so that's something I told him I would look into and bring back to the next meeting. And then the, the biggest portion of our meeting was uh, devoted to the social media. And um, that's something that, you know, I think is going to be one of the things we discuss on the board's goal setting meetings in September. Um, and um, there were some good ideas that had come out of it. One thing we did discover uh, was that there's no way that you can make people um, get information no matter how you put it out there. Uh, we did have one interesting comment that I am going to share with everyone was that People, we send out little flyers with all the activities that are on the RMA calendar, which is a, a, the best source because they're the ones that have to book them. And uh, some people throw it away because of the paper it's printed on. And my guess is, is if you print it on better people, paper, somebody's going to complain that you printed it on better paper. So, you know, when you're trying to get information out, I'm not sure there's a, a perfect solution. <coughs> But those are some of the challenges that you face when people put up different barriers. So that's the end of my report. Ralph, I understand that you've uh, volunteered to at least assist us in giving us a direction for how we can use social media uh, platforms uh, to accomplish what we need to do. 
Thank you. <laughs> Ralph, Ralph and, and I clarified in there, I said Ralph um, offered to discuss it with me. Yes. A little, thank you for any a, input. A you I, I, don't, I don't remember him taking on the task. <laughs> <laughs> well put. <laughs> All right. Now can, can you go, Jim? Okay. <laughs> Let me first say I want to thank everyone. I know they've all gone home tonight, and I know they had family commitments, but I was very pleased with uh, the public output and input. And I wrote down two pages of notes, and we also had some other information passed up here to Stephanie, to myself. And uh, we've got a big task in front of us. And I'm looking forward to trying to get the best we can to get the speeding under control and address the stop signs. And one thing, and, and you see it now more than ever, is since school is out, kids are loading up in the golf carts, and it's not like, I mean, Mike, you can, in the days when we were growing up, we were on our bicycles. Okay, now the kids, the parents think, go ahead and take the golf cart and do whatever you want. And just a reminder for all the parents that in Article 7, Section F of the CCNRs, you have to have a valid driver's license to use a golf cart. So I know we've got more than a couple of kids that need to uh, be schooled on that, as well as more than a couple parents. As for the Compliance Committee, we met on Tuesday, July 10th. We had a uh, we discussed eight. We had a couple of no-shows that got postponed, but we had a closed session hearing. And um, we have a new, uh, or not necessarily new, let's just say our staff did a very good job this last month in increasing the amount of speeding violations and CSD. Uh, John's not here to hear it, but they did a good improvement on stop sign violations. So we're slowly going in the right directions, but we have some major streets that need to be addressed, whether it's with speed humps, uh, speed bumps, uh, flashers, stop signs, and that's a task that we're gonna have to sit down and talk about. That's it. Um, I just realized that, Greg, let me get your attention again for a minute. Just realized that did did we did the does the board need to give you a direction on this joint security committee and do you think you have that direction? No, I have your consensus, so I'm gonna be happy with it. All right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't sure. It seemed like we talked about it but didn't really <laughs> didn't really come to a conclusion. I think I heard him say something. I'll set up a meeting. He might it might have, you might not have heard it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, the uh, next item is, uh, the next committee is uh, Governing Docs. That's Rob's, he's not here. Rob's not, not here. here. Nope. Next item is the uh, Maintenance Committee. And uh, we did not have, the Maintenance Committee did not meet this month due to uh, most of the maintenance <coughs> people being overwhelmed <coughs> by 4th of July. Um, but I would like to share something with you that has occurred since the last uh, board meeting. Uh, CSD has agreed to continue the use of granular insecticides to control midge flies. That's huge. That application will be one time a year in May, and then follow-up applications of the liquid will be used through the summer as necessary. And I think that's totally adequate. We, we reached a major concession with them on that issue since the last board meeting. So that's a very positive thing. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, uh, appointing a nominating uh, committee chair. And uh, <coughs> even though it's still several months from nominating a, um, a new board, I think they're trying to get rid of us quickly, Cheryl. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as noted, President Bauer has said he'd like to be appointed as a chair of the nominating committee, so I'd like to nominate Alex Bauer to be the, the uh, chair of that committee. I think that's very appropriate since he isn't here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'll second it. <laughs> <laughs> it's been moved and seconded that, that uh, uh, Alex 
Bauer, uh, be the uh, chair of the <coughs> nominated committee that will convene pretty shortly to, to uh, try and get rid of Cheryl and I. <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And uh, Parks did not meet apparently. I don't have no. anything for them. And Recreation? Recreation did not meet. Our normal meeting date would have been the 4th of July holiday. However, I do want to make mention of events that we have coming up in August. On August 4th, we have a self-defense uh, class that's being offered here at the RMA building. Uh, Sign-ups are um, ongoing. On August 18th, we have a free casino trip to Red Hawk Casino. Uh, Sign-ups are here at RMA. And on August 31st, we have a San Francisco Giants baseball game. Uh, people can sign up at the RMA building as well. Thank you. Uh, at this time, um, it's traditional for the board members to have three minutes to talk about anything they like. And Greg's got his thumb on the button. <laughs> uh, anybody just jump right in here. I'm good. I think we're exhausted. Yeah, I have, I have no comments. <laughs> comments. Okay, uh, our next board meeting will be on August 21st at 6.30, and I hope we have the same kind of turnout. <laughs> Thank you.